My name is Gamara. I am of the Crow people from Champanizac First Nation. Um, my English name is Harold Johnson. Um, Longo People's Place, Kode uh, Dun Kai. Uh, we started that in 1995, and it is a educational tourism um, operation, uh, educating visitors and interested peoples and organizations about the pre-contact history of First Nations people here in the Yukon. It's a First Nation tourism business, so it's open to all people. And um, we've had like elders' homes come out and and book with us, and we've had um, all school groups, and so it's it's open to all age groups, and it's wheelchair accessible also. The camp itself is like a walk through museum. It would be like taking a walk back in time a thousand years ago. It's how our people lived here off the land with the animals. Like thousands of years ago, you'll see caribou fences, fish traps, deadfall traps, eagle feather gopher snares, and, you know, all the things that our people used, utilized to um, survive in this country. Yeah, it's kind of been, it's, compar it's been compared to, like, a living museum. Wow. And, um, you know, because, like, we try to re build everything back to the original sizes and everything. Yeah, we have winter shelters, and in the summer we build sh summer shelters and smoke houses and underground cache, meat caches, caribou fences. It's all in one area that we take people through on a guided tour, uh -huh. explaining the usage and the times people use these things in that. 2019 will be 24 years, and next year will be our 25th anniversary. Education, because this is, the Yukon is probably one of the harshest countries in, on the planet. And our people survived here for thousands of years. And how we survived here has always been uh, my curiosity, because I've been raised in, raised up here and, you know, run a trap line and hunt and fish and everything else. But, you know, that's all with the convenience of 2019, skidoos, cars, boats, um, you know, rifles and everything else. But not so long ago right here, our ancestors, they've had their own ways of surviving here for thousands of years. That was proven by time successful. And uh, I was all, I'm always curious about history. And so I was, it became like a, just a natural curiosity and then I I'm old enough to remember a lot of old elders that um, didn't go to mission school even wow. and I'd ask talk to them about the old ways and the old stories and once the old people know that you're really interested in it they will share and they'll give you information you know as as they see Yeah. And then just to share that information, and again, you know, because like this land is so rich with stories and history yeah. that um, predates um, contact. Eh? Yeah, it's um, resilience. It's you know, it's um, it brings back you know when people because I, I deal with a lot of school groups also. Okay. And when I see, uh, like, young First Nation people, like, especially little ones, uh, when they come through the tour and they how they act and everything, and you can see they're just so proud of themselves and their history, you know, what, when they when they learn how a deadfall works or, you know, caribou snares or anything, yeah, you know, then they seem like it, it instills pride in the, in the kids and that, you know, a lot of the barriers are like, it's kind of um, up to me as an individual whether I succeed or fail or whatever. Like if there's, because as far as I'm concerned, um, there's no real failure in my work. There's various variations of success. 
but there is no failure because you know we are bringing and educating people and you, you know as long as uh, barriers uh, probably I can see capacity like having young First Nations people um, go into this business of um, cultural tourism and that mm -hmm. um, because the wage competition and you know everything else it mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's um, capacity development and I think that would be one of the biggest barriers because the camp is a, kind of like a living museum and it's there but without people it wouldn't be living it would be like any other museum I guess you know a bunch of dead objects in uh, behind glass almost but it's it's the people that bring the camp to life like interacting with um, First Nations people because that's what a lot of um, my clients want to do they just want to talk to a First Nations person about you know their history and hear it from them I, so it's probably that's one of the barriers it's going to be um, product development and finding really good enthusiastic people that are educated in the you know the history and everything of of the area but we did do a course last spring in may and um well, we hosted we supplied the facilities and um, it was through, I believe it was, I know um, Yukon Wilderness Association was part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, Yukon First Nation Tourism Association and YTG Tourism. Wow. And it, the participants stayed at the camp and used the camp as their base. And, and um, they ended up taking like a one month course and I think they ended up with like wilderness first aid, swift water rescue, um, food safe, um, super host and a few oh, other. Awesome. So they're, what, they're starting to go, it's starting to, it was a pilot project last year so you know would do more of things like that it would be great. But you know like um, Aboriginal tourism is a grown industry and it, it's just going to continue on from here. Probably lifelong learning and adapting, you know, because our people had to, you know, we were, our old ways have, uh, are gone, so we've had to adapt and learn new ways r really fast and on the fly, and our people have been, like, adapting and, and um, it's like lifelong learning, you're never too old to stop learning, you know. Just down the way here, about maybe a kilometer down the road, um, there's an old trail that comes goes right through this valley from to the coast all the way through to Huchai and up through probably to Fort Selkirk. Mm -hmm. And um, along that trail, just down here, there's a whole group of... Um, rocks probably maybe 10 15 rocks all kind of in a scattered along the trail yeah and uh, the elders took me there in the early 90s before i started the camp because they knew because i was talking to them about the camp and so they're they're helping me with them um, showing me different things and they took me over there and they said when you bring kids around here take them to this place because this place here is uh, all these rocks here were people at one time and they were all traveling together and they ran into another person and that one group of people started to harass and bully that other person oh, picking awesome. on them yeah. and but what they didn't realize that he was a very powerful medicine man and what he did was he turned them all into stone right there, and they've never moved since. Wow. And the lesson the old people were saying was that that's why you don't want to be a bully, because on the trail of life, 
you'll never move from that spot. You'll always, you know, that that's your your existence. Wow, that's pretty you know, powerful. It, um, so the land has like lots of stories like that, and I like um, encourage everyone, anyone to the, to talk to the elders, and you know, because the lot we're 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 not. We don't have as many elders with that ancient knowledge as we used to, mm-hmm. and time is not really on our side on this. So, to in terms of um, gathering knowledge and you know keeping these old stories alive and these old lessons and that. When I f- first started building it in '95, um, I, it took me like from early spring and we opened in I think it was in July of 95 but I got lost in the background building fish traps deadfall brush camps and everything like that and then when I had to come out and strap on an apron and and use a hammer and saw and everything to build like the tea and bannock structures and outhouses and things um it was hard to. It was so much better to go back there and just work with the natural world and you know what was there and everything. Oh yeah. As opposed to measuring and cutting and pounding. And, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, working with skin and you know, put, tying things together and everything. Wow. Yeah, but kind of. Two different, totally different worlds. I remember when I first started this um, in '95. I I told an elder then that um, I said, "Well, I'm relatively a young guy. Uh, if I work pretty well around the clock for the next five years, I'll have this whole whole camp built, and it will just be a self runner, and I'll go off do something else." And he said, "No, you're going to be there the rest of your life." <laughs> so um, I don't know. I hope we are we are expanding all the time. Like every year, we try to add more to the the back the pre contact camp, or we're been expanding. Like last year, we have we did a we have a cook shack, indoor cook shack. People can use now, and showers, gravity fed showers, and this and we had wall tents. And this year, we're building. Um, some modern traditional shelters. Nice, nice. So we're constantly trying to grow and expand and, yeah, we got too much um, time invested in it now to quit or do anything else. Too (laughs) old to do anything else now. (laughs) 